Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. In preparing to talk to you today, I could not resist consulting some of the great minds who walked this planet Earth, such as Albert Einstein. Einstein also said, don't listen to someone who knows all the answers. Listen to someone who asks all the questions. Independently of Einstein, I've been telling students over the years that, I quote, you never get the right answer unless you ask the right question. So I'll be encouraging you to seek, work, to seek and work out what are the key questions and to try to answer them. I'm Rod Watson and I've been doing various mathematical tasks at the Robertson Girls High School in Melbourne since 2005. So I was involved as a school counsellor as a parent when my daughter attended last century. <laughs> what about getting the right question? Two of my examples involve mathematics, but these are accessible to non-mathematicians. First of all, suppose that an express train travels from Melbourne to Stor, a rural regional town, 240 kilometres away at 120 kilometres per hour. On its return, it travels at 80 kilometres per hour. Ignoring starting, stopping and little things like that, what's the average speed for the journey? You might like to jump in straight away and say, 100 kilometres per hour because 120 plus 80 all divided by 2 equals 100. But let's have a look at that. If the forward journey is 140 kilometres at 120 kilometres per hour, the time taken will be two hours. For the return journey of 240 kilometres at 80 kilometres per hour, it will take three hours. This gives a total of five hours. But if we look at five hours travel at 100, at 100 kilometres per hour, the purported average speed, the train would actually travel 500 kilometres, not 480. Something must be wrong. The key question that must be asked is, what does average speed really mean? Well, what about total distance travelled divided by time for the journey, which is 480 kilometres divided by five hours, and that's 96. So 96 kilometres per hour is the average speed, not 100. So the obvious answer is not necessarily the correct one. My second example comes from calculus, but don't worry, if you have not, nor never will study it, the example does not involve high mathematics. Have a look at the diagram. We have two corridors that meet at right angles. Suppose that one is p metres across and the other is q metres across. What is the length of the longest thin pole that can be carried horizontally around the corner? Thinking about the problem, are we asked to find a maximum distance? It appears so. But if we really try to delve out what is wanted, the penny might drop that the length of the longest thin pole is represented by the shortest distance from wall to wall by just touching the inside corner, as you can see in the diagram. So when really seeing out the question of what appeared to be initially a question to find the maximum distance is actually finding a minimal one. Paradoxical? Perhaps. Another example comes from building infrastructure in cities. It is a state, it is the job of state governments to work out what's the best way to get people to and from work, as well as students to and from school and assist properly. In many cases, this has resulted in spending lots of money building motorways. But what is the question? Should we be aiming to move vehicles, often carrying one, one person, or moving people? 
a train carrying 900 passengers is more efficient in terms of energy than 600 cars that might be used instead. Train would be quicker for many passengers. And I'm not arguing for not spending money on roads. We do need an efficient and safe road system. But we can really do better moving people. So seeking out what is the right, right question requires research. What is the most efficient way of moving people to their destinations? Since the arrival of Europeans in 1788 in Australia, Indigenous people have suffered disadvantage. There have been advances such as the Mabo decision, but there is still much poverty and lack of educational opportunity. Australian governments have tried to decide what is best. Finally, the National Agreement on Closing the Gap has answered a key question. What do Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders think will improve outcomes? This resulting, it results in the coalition of peaks. I'm not sure whether First Nations people have ever been asked about their needs in quite this way in setting up this committee. There's also a related question resulting from the severe bushfires. Archaeologists seem to agree that off-season burning of forests by Indigenous people was done in such a way that out-of-control bushfires did not occur. There's still a further question to be answered. How should remaining native grasslands be managed to preserve their integrity and also to allow native animals to flourish? There is work to be done and quite possibly by the younger generation. We're starting to realise that the management of the environment by indigenous people over thousands of years was very successful. Somewhat more deviously, there are organisations that ask the key question about how can we appear to do something, but in fact end up doing the opposite. In a recent Four Corners program on PBS Frontline from the USA about recycling, it showed about big plastic used the idea of recycling to draw attention away from the industry itself, allowing it to expand exponentially. Big plastic came out in favour of recycling. Their aim was to increase the volume of plastics used by clever marketing. We've now reached a situation where there are 9 billion kilograms of plastics deposited in the oceans annually, more than one kilogram per person. Some of these plastics break down into micro or even nanoparticles and work their way up the food chain. Rather than reduce, reuse, recycle, should we as consumers not refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, as far as plastic is concerned? This might go some of the way of answering the question of what we can do to reduce or even eliminate rubbish that is damaging our environment. We in Australia, have currently stockpiles of rubbish that has nowhere to go. And also remember that the chasing arrows on the back of plastic containers is no guarantee of reuse or recycling. Sometimes asking what's thought to be the right question can lead to failure. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Have you heard of WD-40? It comes in spray cans and can be used as a cleaning agent, a lubricant, and for assisting the removal of a nut that are rusted onto a bolt, amongst other things. But why is it called WD-40? Apparently getting the formulation right meant that there were 39 unsuccessful attempts before achieving the product that was desired at the 40th attempt. Failure causes us to go back and question our assumptions and check whether there are questions that were not asked or factors that were not considered. Failure has played a major part in the advancement of scientific knowledge in the 20th century. In 1887, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted an experiment to determine the existence of a weightless, 
or the current terminology of then, imponderable fluid, known as the ether, that was supposed to be the carrier of light waves by measuring the speed of light in two perpendicular directions and detecting the difference. The experiment failed to detect any difference, which led to the theory of special relativity as proposed by Albert Einstein in 1905. Einstein wrote, if the michelson morley experiment had not brought us into serious embarrassment, no one would have regarded the relativity theory as an embarrassment. Often, issues come up for debate in the media and other places, and there are accusations of bias. This leads to raise a matter of false balance, or both sideism, or the fallacy of equal time, as philosophers of science have called it. This is where an issue is being presented as being more balanced between opposing viewpoints than the evidence supports. You should be aware of groups of people who are very vocal about the right not to have their children vaccinated against common diseases. These people are usually known as anti-vaxxers. Should they be given equal time with those who support child vaccination? Where is the evidence? Is the question that should be asked. There are diseases that have been virtually eliminated by vaccination, such as chickenpox, measles, and mumps, all of which I had as a child, incidentally. Uh, measles, for example, can be fatal. On a global scale, smallpox has been virtually eliminated, whereas it used to have a devastating effect on populations. I remember attending primary school where a girl had her legs in irons, irons because she contracted poliomyelitis or polio. Again, this is extremely rare in Australia due to vaccination. So do anti-vaxxers have the right to equal time? I don't think so. I'll let the writer that there will always be a small number of children who for various reasons, genetic or otherwise, where vaccination could be life-threatening. And of course, this needs to be taken into account. What I question is blanket arguments against vaccination. Is this why there are no papers supporting anti-vaccination or non-vaccination? Scientific papers have to go through a process of peer review before they're published. There have been some communities, even in Australia, who've regarded COVID-19 as a hoax. Well, should we feel sorry for the man in the USA who announced that COVID-19 was a hoax and to prove it went to a party where he contracted the virus and then died? What about climate change and global warming? These have been a topic for discussion for many years. Should equal time be given to those who are deniers? Around 95% of Australian scientists accept the climate evidence of climate change in raised temperatures, more extreme weather, melting of ice caps in polar regions, melting of permafrost in the Arctic, movement of sea creatures further from the equator, and possible permanent damage to the Great Barrier Reef. With fossil fuel burning, and deforestation being two principal factors. There seems to be general acceptance among younger Australians at least. The problem is serious and needs to be addressed urgently. But out of this arises a paradox. Why is it that some accept peer-reviewed science which tells us about COVID-19 and, and its dangers, then asserts that climate change is a hoax or even a plot. Climate change also poses the most difficult of questions. Is global population a problem? This question was asked by the Club of Rome way back in 1968 and was followed with its report in 1960, 1972, The Limits to Growth. As the global population grows and arable land becomes a desert, 
how can we feel feed more and more people, especially given the number of people currently living in poverty? This younger generation will have to work hard on it, be aware of national and religious issues, such as the power of terrorist groups and vested interests. Good luck. Let's return to Einstein again. The important thing is not to stop questioning, he said. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. Or again, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. I was watching War of the Worlds on TV recently, and Jules Verne, the author of the original book, was quoted in saying, what is the most important scientific discovery? Answer, ignorance. Admitting our ignorance may take a lot of courage, but we need to face up to our ignorance all the same. Technology may help design solutions. I recently heard a Science Week talk that the University of New South Wales in trimester three this year is offering the world's first degree in quantum engineering. I believe that some of the answers of the questions of the centres may come from this sort of technology. But don't forget, we are human beings, and so it is the humanities that humanise it. We all need to keep things in proper perspective and support the study of the humanities. Finally, did curiosity kill the cat? Writer Graham Swift wrote in Waterland, people die when curiosity goes. People have to find out. People have to know. How can there be any true revolution till we know what we're made of? So be curious. Ask questions. Look for answers. And if you don't find them, try asking different questions. I wish you well in your endeavours. May you keep posing questions while you're able to do so. I'm Rod Watson, and you have my best wishes.